Good afternoon or morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us on that Knowledge Culture webinar about advancing microbial bioproduction. My name is Geoffroy Malherbe. I'm part of our EMEA Single Use Technologies Business Development Team. And it's my pleasure to introduce this webinar today. We'll go through a very rich and dense agenda to cover various aspects of microbial bioproduction from a peptone application updates to single-use workflows for uh, making um, biological products and microbes. There will be a section about advanced uh, online gas analysis to monitor microbial culture, as well as downstream purification updates and some analytical new tools um, for you to be able to successfully carry out microbial bioproduction. So a few words about the format of your knowledge culture webinar today. It's a rather interactive format. You have the opportunity to ask questions. There will be at the start of some presentations, some presenters will start by your polling question, which you can participate in live. So please stay tuned and watch out for those polling questions. And we will interact about all of that in the final uh, Q&A. So very important. There's already been a previous microbial bioproduction webinar, which you can go look at uh, on the knowledge culture section of thermofisher.com. And this webinar today is an update from this, is addressing some aspects from different angles. So there can be a benefit in watching both of them. And uh, last but not least, it's very important to mention that we are also looking forward to a um, live workshop which you can register for and, uh, and attend, which will be held uh, in May in uh, Vilnius, Lithuania, where we have a microbial bioproduction center. So uh, stay tuned for this on the Knowledge Culture web pages or with your firm official representative. So about our topic of today, indeed, microbial bioproduction is an extremely broad and dynamic field. We see the demand, the need booming, in particular in the area of gene therapy plasmid production. But there is a, a number of already well-established uh, microbial bioproduction applications in the industry, uh, which require an array of technologies uh, to meet all the different demands that can come up based on the various types of processes, uh, induction mechanisms, etc. Indeed, uh, as, as all areas of bioproduction, um, it's a fast evolving space. And in particular, one of the areas we'll cover is the advent of new single use technologies, um, which uh, should bring the microbial field in line with the currently very dominant use of single use technologies in a broader bioproduction. So quick words about who we are, Thermo Fisher Scientific, uh, the world leader in serving science. Uh, indeed, all the innovations you will hear about today, they are fueled by a consistent, um, very high investment in R&D, which allows us to um, bring those the innovations to you, which are presented today. We have in mind the eventual results of uh, our work, our collaboration with uh, our customers, therefore our mission statement to enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. In our bioproduction division, which is the main uh, part of our company involved in this webinar, um, you can find solutions throughout any bioproduction workflow, all the way from the initial cells to um, final release of, uh, of the product. And we like to bring that to you using uh, what we call bioprocessing by design, which is the way to summarize our value proposition around a number of points where we believe there's a difference in collaborating with some official scientific bioproduction. With this um, introduction, uh, closing image provide you, you know, a, a snapshot of how modernizing microbial bioproduction can look like from a single use technologies perspective. But let's move to our first speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Pirko Mohonen, who's uh, one of our cell culture field application scientists, 
will provide you an update about the effective use of peptones in microbial media. Thank you, Seth, and uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for attending our Knowledge Culture webinar today. So my name is Pirko Mohonen, and I work as a field application scientist, and I specialize in KIPCO by production media and supplements. So I will be focusing the next 10 minutes on our peptone solution in microbial cultures. So a very common question I hear is that, what is a peptone? And uh, peptones are also called as uh, hydrogenates. They are derived from natural material, which are then partially digested under controlled conditions by using chemical or enzymatic process. So the reason why peptones are so widely used in bioprocessing, bioprocessing is highlighted on the pie graph on the right. This graph shows the typical mix of nutritional components that we find in peptones. Amino acids, peptides, vitamins, carbohydrates, minerals, trace elements, all the components that mammalian cells and microbes love. Therefore, they can serve as an optimal nutritional source for cells. Peptones can also offer additional benefits to the cells, for example, protection against toxic metabolites, and they have shown to improve productivity and increase biomass when compared to the minimal media. Peptones are also very versatile. Peptones are digested from different sources, and they can also then exhibit different nutritional compositions. So after our peptones are uh, animal origin, coming from milk or animal tissue extract. They are plant origin, uh, coming from soy, wheat, cotton, or pea. And they can be also microbial origin, for example, yeast extract. So screening of different peptones is recommended to help to identify the needs of your particular organism. For example, Arabs and anaerobes have different nutritional preferences based on their oxygenation requirements. Therefore, by trying different peptones with different nutritional profiles, you can find the best fit to your microbial culture process. On this slide, I explain how our peptones are manufactured under strict control. All our peptones are manufactured for bioproduction purposes. So we have validated our peptone manufacturing process to achieve high lot-to-lot -lot consistency by using molecular weight profiles and other analytes such as carbohydrates, vitamins, and nucleosides. So to ensure all overall um, consistency, we have process controls in place for the critical quality steps that impact consistency. For example, we know that time, temperature, and pH during the hydrogenation step are critical to achieve consistency our customers want. We are very stringent when validating our raw materials, but we do monitor all the process steps in the manufacturing as well. So for the digestion step, we look at molecular weight profiles, which is a reflection of degree of the digestion. In the filtration step, if more than one filtration is needed to achieve target, we discard a lot. And just to mention that the peptone manufacturing is a non-aseptic process, and therefore timing for the downstream process is critical. So fast process turnaround is to ensure a low bio burden, which can then affect also the content of the nutrients because contaminating bacteria can potentially consume some of the nutrients. So in the end, we perform analytical testing, look at the end product uh, quality, for the pH, solubility, and even performance to ensure the robustness of the manufacturing process. Here is a list of components that bacteria need in general for growth and production. They need carbon and nitrogen source, inorganic phosphate and sulfur, trace metals and vitamins. And these are readily available in most peptones. We can also provide the uh, analysis data for each peptone composition to identify the optimal nutrition requirement to meet your culture needs. So to make it easy to select a suitable peptone, for your process. On this slide, I will explain how the peptones and chemically defined supplements can be quickly adapted to improve your culture performance. So peptones can really enhance protein production and deliver the desired level of protein quality from the very start of your research all the way to the commercial scale production. Since every supplement and feed is different and each cell and microbe has unique nutritional requirements, it's critical to evaluate a wide range of peptones to identify the ones that work best for your particular production process. So to help you to screen and find the best peptone and supplement, we have developed three different KIPCO peptone starter packs 
containing different animal origin pre or animal origin pathogens. The trend in the microbial industry is to move towards animal free medium to minimize any risks and aiming to even completely chemically defined medium. So if you're already using an animal origin peptone and wish to move to animal origin free peptone, you can screen peptones from the, for example, from the preview pack or the starter pack tree. We also have PIPCO research CD pack for five different chemically defined supplements. We have a comprehensive bio-nutrient manual available for more detailed information. In the bio-nutrient manual, you can find detailed protocols and guides how to screen, titrate, and blend uh, peptones. As I mentioned earlier, the peptones from different sources provide a different mixture of nutrients. Therefore, some organisms prefer blends of peptones. So it is ideal to execute a screening study where different peptone types are evaluated as shown on the slide table five. So once the peptones have been identified, uh, it is critical to characterize the culture to establish the baseline of performance and identify key process drivers so that they can be monitored and controlled during the manufacturing. This slide shows a snapshot of uh, how different peptones can have a different effect in growth depending on the microbe. These evaluations are done in a CX flask with four different microbes, E. coli, Papillus, Staphylococcus aureus, and the yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The base menu was M9, minimal salts, and glucose. So each culture was supplemented separately with 1% uh, uh, of plant-based peptone from the preview pack. So in these experiments, PSP, which is triptych soy broth containing trypton, was used as a control medium as the blue dust line. So as you can see, a very different effect of uh, each peptone. Uh, for example, yeast extract uh, works well with the Staphylococcus soy peptone supports E. coli and yeast culture, and the B peptone supports Bacillus. So this shows how important it is to screen and titrate different peptones and blends in your culture to find the most optimal one. So I just wanted to summarize the presentation here. So when we are talking about our Kiko peptones, we can deliver reliable and well-established culture supplements to enhance bioreaction applications. So peptones have been used to manufacture over 150 pharmaceutical drugs for human and animal health applications. And peptones will be used in the development of the next generation of drugs innovations as well. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Perko, for that uh, introduction on peptones. Uh, I'd like to talk today about the workflow around uh, the single-use fermenter. From this um, image, you see the equipment has been installed. What we want to talk about today is the single-use uh, flexible platform that you can have to facilitate the use of the, the, the fermenter just as a recap, as Jeff said, we, we spoke in an earlier uh, workshop about the control and equipment platform. So this information is available on the previous webinar. What I would like to talk to you about today is the um, equipment and the uh, materials that we have been innovating over the last 22 years. Thermo Fisher have been uh, producing single-use materials for over 22 years and developing a range of materials and systems for use in bioproduction. We now have an extensive uh, range of materials that can be used in an open architecture approach for flexible containment, rigid containment, and supporting the bioprocess equipment. We have a range of two-dimensional, three-dimensional standard uh, bioprocess containers, a range of speciality uh, containers for particular applications, uh, a range of liners and fluid transfer assemblies that can be used for transferring materials from uh, media makeup into the production vessel. We have a range of rigid containment systems that can be used for uh, media makeup, for sample prep, for transition of materials. So with a combination of both flexible and rigid materials, we can 
configure these to fit your workflow and your material needs. Just to give you an idea, we have um, supporting materials for your fermentation. So we have mixers, integrity test systems, heat exchangers that will allow you to um, prepare your media to um, warm it or cool it so it can be added to the reactor directly from the cold room or for processing off the fermenter. And just to um, indicate, we have a universal control platform that can be used to control not only fermentation, microbial, mammalian, and also control the formulation and mixing of medias, buffers, and materials required around your workflow. But what I want to talk about next is the materials that are required for the workflow around microbial fermentation. As Perko said, you need a media, peptones, additives that need to go into the fermenter. So we have developed a range of support materials that allow you to transition from uh, production of materials like antifoam into methods by which you can add these to the, a single-use fermenter. This slide indicates the production of antifoam using uh, autoclave bottles. You then can put that through a disposable funnel into a single-use bag that then can be connected directly onto your fermenter bag. In the same way, you can make up media feeds. So this slide indicates how you would set up the media feed to inoculate your starter culture. That culture is then placed into the 10-liter bioprocess container, which is used to aliquot into your shake flasks for um, initial inoculation before uh, incubation, then into the bioreactor. When the fermenter is actually used, you would need to produce your media, uh, and this can be done in both um, non-GMP and GMP format. We have a range of powder tainers that would allow you to add the peptones, the yeast extract, and the salts into your bioprocess con container uh, through a powder port. You can then add um, WFI or other liquids, mix, and then through the use of uh, transfer assemblies, pass that into the fermenter. In the same way, you can use a closed system for batch feed prep, which you can use a single-use mixer, and you can add your yeast extracts, peptones, and other salts into there as well. And to transfer into the fermenter, we would use a range of filter and tube sets uh, and you can filter directly into a storage bag for use uh, later, or you can filter directly into your fermenter. Additionally, you may require uh, acid and base. The next two slides just uh, illustrate the way in which you could prepare your acid and base solutions. Similar to the antifoam, you'd use the disposable funnel, add to a bioprocess container, which then can be connected directly to your uh, fermenter. So that was the acid, and the next slide just indicates the base. So once you've got your materials uh, prepared, you can add the uh, antifoam, the acid, base, and feeds to the top of the bioreactor. This slide is designed to illustrate how you can make those connections uh, this is the top of a standard bag, but to make things a little easier, we can customize the, the tubing configurations and the options available for additions or bag manipulations. This slide gives you an idea of possible tubing assemblies. Again, these can be configured around your workflow to enable you to optimize the process of media preparation, additions, and manipulations onto the uh, single-use fermenter. 
And after the culture, you obviously would need to look at harvest. So in, uh, depending on whether you're looking at pelletized material or whether you're looking at um, the supernatant from your um, culture, we can either supply uh, centrifuges uh, to pellet your material or we can look at a range of downstream transfer assemblies, bags and um, materials for you to move on to the downstream processing stage. Um, thank you very much for that and any questions? Thank you, Anthony. Um, the next subject is real-time monitoring of respiratory quotient using online gas analysis mass spectrometry. Uh, three subjects will be covered in this uh, short slide set. Uh, mass spectrometry as a process analytical tool component. Uh, I'll provide some examples of microbial process monitoring by mass spectrometry. And then uh, a brief introduction to the technology of magnetic sector mass spectrometry and the analytical capabilities. So whether uh, monitoring lab scale, pilot plant scale, or production scale fermentation and cell culture processes, Mass spectrometry has been used for many years to monitor sparge gas and uh, headspace gases from many different types and sizes of fermenter and bioreactor. Um, there are a range of platforms of this kind of mass spectrometer suitable either for installation in a lab environment, a benchtop version, or for uh, installation in more demanding uh, industrial installation conditions, uh, we have an industrially packaged uh, mass spectrometer. They both actually share the same uh, magnetic sector technology. Uh, they're just packaged differently according to the environment. The primary function of this kind of mass spectrometer is monitoring uh, fermentation and cell culture processes. That is uh, measuring the composition of inlet or sparge gas to fermenters and then comparing that with the outlet gas from the headspace of a fermenter. Um, principally, it is air gases that are monitored, oxygen, CO2, nitrogen, and argon, uh, but it is a fully functional mass spectrometer, and it's capable of monitoring uh, accurately many different types of gas species that can be found in a, uh, in a headspace of a fermenter, um, commonly components such as methanol, ethanol, um, hydrogen, ammonia, H2S uh, are routinely monitored by this technology. It is a, a PAT tool, so it's integrated into a workflow uh, where you may have a fermenter, a bioreactor with controller. Uh, data from the mass spectrometer uh, routinely would be fed to a DCS or SCADA system, which might provide then a, a further control of the fermenter process. Uh, things like feed rates, um, sparge gas rates, um, impeller speeds, and such. Examples of um, bacterial and microbial fermentation processes monitored by mass spectrometry are in slide 43. So, there are two fed batch fermentation processes one is uh, E. coli based, uh, the other is a Cerevisiae um, based fermentation. Um, in the E. coli fed batch fermentation process, this is a process lasting approximately 60 hours. The mass spectrometer is monitoring oxygen, CO2, nitrogen, and argon in the inlet and the outlet of this fermenter and calculating in real time the respiratory quotient. Um, note it that um, at the point when a reagent is introduced at temperature T, uh, the cells change from multiplying to expressing the desired product, and that's observed in that stabilization of respiratory quotient at about uh, 40 hours, where it becomes quite stable at uh, the, ex the expected value of 1. Um, similarly, uh, in the uh, Cerevisiae fed batch fermentation, again, it's approximately 60-hour uh, uh, fed batch process, the mass spec in this case is monitoring the air gases, but also monitoring ethanol. Um, so it's, it's able to detect concentrations of ethanol in the uh, vent gas of the fermenter, in addition to calculating the respiratory quotient. In this case, ethanol is the initial carbon source, and you note that uh, after 
approximately 10 to 15 hours, the uh, ethanol source is depleted, and then the cells begin to switch to consuming glucose. And you, uh, this is observed in the respiratory quotient, uh, again, um, settling to the expected value of approximately 1. So in both cases, the mass spec is validating that the process is proceeding in, in accordance to the expectations. In the next example, um, th this slide explains how the respiratory quotient value uh, is, is affected by the carbon source that um, uh, cells or microbes are consuming. So in this case, uh, the process begins with hexose um, being consumed, and uh, the, if you look at the, the ratio of CO2 to oxygen molecules, um, they, they yield a theoretical value of 1. You have six molecules of CO2 divided by six molecules of, of oxygen. After approximately 50 hours, uh, hexose has been depleted, and so these microorganisms uh, begin to consume stearic acid as their carbon source. And you note that the number of molecules of CO2 in this case, divided by the number of molecules of oxygen, provides a theoretical RQ value of 0 0.7. Uh, and both of these, uh, these RQ values are very precisely monitored uh, by the mass spectrometer in real time. Um, as stated at the beginning, this is a magnetic sector mass spectrometer. Um, the principle of operation is uh, it is a scanning electromagnet. So um, like most conventional mass spectrometers, it consists of three main components. Uh, first sample is introduced into an ion source. Uh, this is an electron impact ion source um, where electrons produced by a filament um, impact with the neutral molecules of the sample gas to produce positively charged ions. Uh, the second stage is where those ions are accelerated into a scanning magnetic field. Um, the radius of uh, an ion through a magnetic field is a function of its mass, um, the number of charge that it receives during ionization, and the magnetic field strength. So by varying the magnetic field, uh, it's possible to select ions of a given mass to pass into the detector system. The de detector then is the third component of this scanning magnetic sector mass spec. Um, the uh, resulting ions from any, any given uh, mass that go into the detector are measured at a conventionally a Faraday detector. Um, the peak height that's observed in the spectrum is directly proportional then to the concentration. Um, there are many types of mass spectrometer used uh, in, in the pharma and biopharma processes. Um, this is the most uh, precise and reliable method for monitoring off gases from fermentation processes. Uh, it should also be noted that um, uh, this, this particular type of mass spectrometer is routinely employed for monitoring multiple uh, fermenter or bioreactors. So by combining a scanning magnetic sector mass spectrometer with a multi-point inlet, it's possible to utilize a single spectrometer for monitoring many uh, process sample points. And finally, um, the, uh, the analytical performance of this type of mass spectrometer. This uh, displays data from seven days continuous monitoring of um, air gases uh, from this magnetic sector mass spec. And you can observe that the mean values for nitrogen, oxygen, CO2 in this case are very stable over time. Um, typically, the day to day uh, mean values for carbon dioxide vary by as little as one parts per million. And for nitrogen and oxygen, uh, in the region of 50 parts per million. So it's able to observe uh, very small changes in sparge gas concentration and sparge gas composition compared to off-gas composition, uh, th thus yielding very precise measurements of respiratory quotient. So at that point, I'll hand it over to, to my colleague, uh, Zoltan. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for your time and interest. Um, Let's start with the polling question. So 
on average, how many chromatography steps are you using in your purification processes? A, one or none, B, two, C, three, D, four or more. In the next few minutes, I would like to highlight a couple of solutions we have for um, microbiome-made biologics in our two chromatographic product lines. Let's start with the Capture Select resin family, which is the largest portfolio of CGMP grade affinity resin designed for antibody and antibody-related targets, recombinant proteins, viruses, and vaccines. The Capture Select technology utilizes the unique heavy chain only antibodies of the camelids. The advantage of using antibodies without light chains is their simplicity and improved stability while the selectivity is maintained. The best ligand candidate, which is the very region of these camelid IGs, is selected by a high throughput screening based method. Then the sequence is expressed in yeast, and the final production process is free of animal originated components. The ligands are conjugated uh, with agarose and porous base beads for testing, and the best performing variant will become the resin, which can be used in CGMP processes. We are producing ligands in thousands of liter scale to support phase three clinical trials and commercial scale bioproduction. We have been using this workflow for more than 15 years now for both our internal projects and custom resin development projects. If you cannot find a suitable solution on the market and you would like to have an affinity solution that enables a robust platform purification, we can certainly develop a custom capture select resin for you. As you can see, the applied workflow consists of five work packages and starts with library construction in E. coli, followed by the mentioned high throughput screening for specificity, my dilution conditions, uh, to save your product of interest and ligand stability, of course, for resin reuse. Once we have the top four to six candidates, the sequences are expressed in yeast and the scale-up studies are performed. In work package four, the created prototypes are then uh, tested by the customer using real-life feed stream and process conditions. And at the end of work package four, the final candidate is selected. PD can be continued by the customer while we are upgrading the resin to bioprocess grade for CGMP applications, which is called the work package file or the final element of this workflow. This consists of three main activities on our end, validation of the production process, processes, development of the leakage ELISA for QC purposes to detect leach ligands, and compilation of the regulatory support file or package. As I mentioned earlier, we are developing affinity solutions for three main areas. As you can see, uh, proteins, antibodies, and antibody-related targets, and viruses and vaccines. Products in the top two rows are all readily available off the shelf, but the research use only, or RU or products, have not been upgraded to CGMP grade yet due to lack of interest and demand until now. However, if you find one of these resins suitable for your application, please feel free to come to us because we can upgrade these resins for you to buy a process grade without issues, but we would need your commitment and support for these activities. Since certain fats um, such as Lucentis and Cynthia uh, can be produced in microbial hosts, therefore the Kappa Binder, Kappa XP or the highlighted CH1XL can be idle off-the-shelf candidates for affinity capture. The CH1 extra resin is able to bind to the CH1 domain of the human heavy chains and does not capture the free light chains and light chain dimers, which are usually overexpressed in such processes. This resin is thereby able to provide high purity in a single step as shown on the gel and the chromatograms below. This resin is the upgraded version of IDG CH1, both in terms of capacity and elution characteristics. And with this resin, as you can see, 19 gram per liter DBC can be achieved for fats, and the product of interest can be elicited at higher pH, such as pH 4, 5, with additives such as magnesium chloride or arginine. The porous resins are part of the other product line we are offering. The unique features of these resins are coming from the uncompressible nature of polymeric polystyrene divinyl benzene beads and the wide open pore structure, which is optimized for large biomolecules. The benefit of these attributes is improved mass transfer compared to the soft gel agarose-based resins, 
And as you can see, high resolution and high dynamic binding capacity can be maintained over a wide range of flow rates. And the higher flow rates lead to improved productivity, of course. We have two cation exchangers, the standard Poros HS, which was the first product that combined the Poros features, which is high capacity, high resolution, and high flow rates. And the next generation XS offers even higher capacity with maintained resolution and added salt tolerance for up to 15 millisiemens per centimeter to the list of features. As you can see, the access is able to combine successfully all these beneficial attributes of such resin in a single product. We have four anion exchangers and porous beads two weak. The PI with polyethylene in them mixed amine surface and the D with dinatyl amine chemistry which is similar to the EAE, but still somewhat different. The HQ, which is one of the most unique porous resins, offers both weak and strong functionality, as it is created from the PI by quaternizing it to 60%. This way, the HQ resin combines the best of both worlds, the unique selectivity of weak anion exchangers and high capacity of strong anion exchangers. Finally, the porous FQ was created to combine high capacity, high resolution, and salt tolerance for up to 15 millisiemens per centimeter into a single product, similar to the XS. Last but definitely not least, we have launched three HIC resins, the Ethyl, the Benzyl, and the Benzyl Ultra. And as you can see, we wanted to extend the hydrophobicity range offered by other HIC resins on the market. The surface hydrophobicity determines the mode of operation. Therefore, we recommend the ethyl for binder lit applications of very hydrophobic molecules. While the benzyl can be used both in binder lit or flow through mode depending on the hydrophobicity of your molecule, and the extremely hydrophobic benzyl ultra was designed for flow through applications such as aggregate removal without addition of salt or at very low salt concentrations. And finally, these are the different formats we are offering. The leakage ELISA kits are developed for QC purposes for leach ligand detection, as discussed. We offer robo columns and one mil, five mil prepack columns to support process development. And the main capture select ligands are also available in HPLC column format and uh, as biotin Alexa dye conjugates for different analytical purposes listed here. And um, it's not listed here yet, but we have launched larger scale prepack columns with capture select resins this January, and the porous columns are also arriving shortly, so stay tuned for the updates. And with that, I would like to thank you for the attention and uh, let us know if you would like to evaluate any of our resins. We are happy to provide you with samples. And I'm handing over to Rob Osborne to discuss the analytical techniques. Thank you very much, Zoltan. My name is Rob Osborne. I'm a technical sales specialist within the bioproduction division at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Before I continue with my presentation, I just thought I would read out the um, polling question that you should now see. We'd like to know what is the most important factor when choosing and validating an impurity quantitation assay? Is it A, that the assay is already used in a regulatory approved manufacturing process? Is it B, the sensitivity and specificity specifications? Is it C, the cost? Or is it D, the availability of local supplier support? So for the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to provide both a very high level overview of all of the contaminant and impurity detection monitoring assays that we offer within the bioproduction division and then i'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about our solution for residual host cell dna quantitation so at a high level just to provide a, an introduction for all of the assays that we have available we have assays based on two separate technologies the first of which is dna sequencing for microbial identification and this is primarily used within a biomanufacturing environment for environmental contaminant monitoring. Second to that, we have our qPCR platform for where we have a, a variety of assays, which I, I would say are more process related. 
So we have solutions for contaminant detection, viruses and mycoplasma species. And we also have host cell impurity quantitation solutions, the res residual DNA quantitation assay that I'll go into in more detail, but also solutions for host cell protein quantitation. And we also have um, a qPCR solution for leached protein A quantitation. But I'd like to spend the remainder of the time that I have available introducing in a little more detail our solution for residual host cell DNA analysis. Why do we need to monitor for residual host cell DNA? Biological products produced in any cell culture will contain certain unique impurities, including host cell DNA and host cell proteins. And these host cell impurities can have an effect on both the shelf life of the drug product and also the efficacy of the final product. And so as a result of that, there are regulatory expectations that need to be met in terms of the levels of these host cell impurities. Where would we look to test for levels of um, DNA within a manufacturing process? Obviously, we'd look at a final drug product, but then we can also start to monitor for this parameter much earlier in the manufacturing process, as early actually as the harvesting and cell removal stages. But I think predominantly you will find this assay most useful within the downstream purification stages used for both lot release and also for in-process control. So what is the solution? We have our ResDNA-Seq assay, a qPCR-based assay which for which we provide a full workflow solution. And by that, I mean we have, first of all, an optimized sample prep method for the quantitative recovery of nucleic acids. We have the qPCR assay itself, which is a highly sensitive assay. We've designed this assay to have limits of quantitation for mammalian DNA as low as 1.5 picogram per mil and for limits of quantitation for microbial DNA as low as 15 picograms per mil. And that's with very high specificity. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in some of the subsequent slides. The assay itself is a rapid testing method. So from the point of sampling to achieving usable data, the assay has been designed to work within a less than five hour time frame. And all of that with highly consistent performance um, from kit to kit, lot to lot on an ongoing basis. As I say, the workflow itself or, or the solution that we provide is a full workflow solution, starting off first of all with our PrepSeq kits for nucleic acid recovery. We then have the assay itself, and the assay itself, as I've mentioned, is a qPCR assay. So for which this, we have a recommended qPCR platform. We have our Quant Studio 5 instrument, and we recommend this platform because we've done extensive testing of all of these assays on this specific technology. We also recommend this because the Quant Studio 5 instrument is compatible with our AccuSeq analysis software. And this has been tailored specifically for these assays to provide a very seamless workflow in terms of generating the data and reporting that data out with the results. It allows full enablement of all regulatory compliances, for example, 21 CFR Part 11. We have a range of assays within the ResDNA-Seq portfolio covering the majority of host cell lines that would be commonly found within a uh, biopharma manufacturing environment, both mammalian and microbial. The next few slides, I just want to detail a little bit more our solution for Pekia pastoris. So this first slide is showing an amplification plot across a tenfold dilution series. And what we can see here is that the CT values for each concentration are exactly where we would expect them to be. So what that's showing us is that even at the very low concentrations, we get a highly efficient amplification. So that can give us some confidence that the sensitivity of the assay is where it needs to be in terms of our limits of detection and quantitation. 
It's also a very specific assay, and that's what's shown on this slide here. So again, across a range of different concentrations from 300 femtograms uh, up to three nanograms, we have good consistent performance even in the presence of a spiked DNA, uh, unrelated DNA. We're talking specifically here of human DNA, so we see results for the presence of, of no human DNA, 10 nanograms of human DNA, and finally 100 nanograms of spiked human DNA. And that specificity is seen not only for human DNA, but also across a range of um, possible um, DNA contaminants that may be within, within the sample. This final slide in terms of the assay performance is showing that we also get um, good consistent performance across a range of concentrations, not only for high molecular weight DNA, but also DNA that's been exposed to a degree of sonication and therefore the DNA will be at a fragmented length. So for even lower molecular weight DNA samples, we still get good consistent performance across a range of concentrations. I tried to emphasize that this is a full workflow solution and important to any qPCR analysis, uh, critical in fact, is, is the sample prep in advance of the analysis itself. So I wanted to just take a, a few moments to introduce the solution that we have with our PrepSeq chemistry. Our PrepSeq chemistry kits are a universal sample prep method for all nucleic acids. So this PrepSeq chemistry kit is applicable not only to the residual um, DNA assay that I'm, I'm discussing in detail here, but also for our mycoplasma and virus detection assays also. It's a magnetic bead-based workflow, so it lends itself very nicely not only to manual sample processing, but also the possibility of automation. So we have large possibilities for, for, for different throughput requirements. And with respect to that, we also have some off-the-shelf automation solutions to cope with those different throughput requirements. So we have protocols for manual sample prep where you can achieve up to 16 extractions per day typically. We have our Automate Express instrument, which we would describe as a medium throughput solution where you can achieve up to 52 extractions per day. The advantage here being that this is a, a fully closed and fully automated workflow. And then finally, for higher throughput requirements, we have our Kingfisher Flex platform where up to 192 extractions per day can be achieved with our, our sample prep. And this slide is just showing some specific examples of using PrepSeq with uh, Pekia Pastora samples. So what we see here is across a range of concentrations, uh, 100 picogram down to one picogram, we see nice consistent recovery, typically above uh, 80%, and with good, nice reproducibility. So in summary, we have a comprehensive solution for residual host cell DNA quantitation. It's a full workflow solution, including all of the required standards and reagents. We have an optimized sample prep solution that is automatable with our prep seat chemistry. The assay itself is extremely sensitive and specific to the host cell DNA being analyzed. And all of that comes with a very high level of consistency, kit to kit, lot to lot, on an ongoing basis. So with that, I, I thank you for your time and your attention, and I would hand it back to our host, Jeff, for any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Rob, and thanks very much to all our speakers today. So um, we have had the chance to run through all the various uh, technical element associated to the presentation. Um, so what I suggest we do now is go through um, three uh, exercises. The first one will be to have a look at uh, the results of the polling. We also want to spend a little bit of time to, uh, to take a little bit more time to announce uh, the following technical workshop to which participants to this webinar may want uh, to take part. And uh, lastly, we'll open the actual uh, Q&A, okay? So 
uh, first item is the polling questions. So we have polling questions today, and uh, it's very important that we have a look at what the audience has been responding to those uh, to those polls. So uh, the last question which was asked by uh, Rob was about uh, the criteria, the important factors when choosing and validating an impurity quantitation assay. So the most frequent answer has been sensitivity and specificity, so technical performance criteria, followed by um, the already used in a regulatory approved uh, process and the other criteria such as local supplier support or cost um, of, um, of a lesser importance to the audience on the webinar. The other polling question, um, which was um, the weak point in the bioprocess workflow between information management systems, analytical equipment, etc. So the most uh, prevalent answer, the main answer of the audience has been uh, the weak point of the institute monitoring devices such as probes and sensors, which is uh, perceived as an important uh, gap by uh, nearly half of the audience. And the lack of information management system is the second most popular answer. Looking at the number of chromatography steps are used in uh, Process, the most frequent answer for half of the audience has been um, three purification steps and then the other answers one, two or four or more uh, have um, they share the, the other half of the of the audience okay so thank you very much for the uh, interactive participation uh, of uh, of all our uh, participants today. Uh, the one thing I want, before we go into the Q&A itself, I want to bring your attention to is, uh, the, is uh, the microbial fermentation um, workshop, which will follow from this webinar. So on May 13th, uh, so you can go to uh, com. And, and type in the search bar knowledge cultural workshops. At our customer evaluation center in Vilnius, Lithuania, um, there will be a full day event um, with uh, practical uh, lab um, demonstrations related to single use uh, microbial fermentation. So this Vilnius site is very, very, very important. It's one of our centers of excellence at Normal Fisher Scientific which has experience with single-use fermentation at 30 and 300 liters since uh, more than five years now, and they've been writing a number of application notes around this technology. So it's an amazing opportunity to see 300 liter single-use fermenters in operation and to directly pick the brains of uh, the experts here who are users of this technology since over five years and can provide you with uh, unprecedented, unprecedented insights uh, in this technology. And there will be much more content around what has been today's agenda for all of you interested in, uh, in learning more. So we, we wholeheartedly invite webinar participants to register their interest on our website for this event in Vilnius, Lithuania on May the 13th. Um, we can move on to the final part of this uh, event, which is uh, to go through the questions. Um, so I think the first question uh, we have received is about the purification part. So I'm going to turn over to uh, Zoltan Gulias. Question is, what is the required target molecule quantity for the custom ligand development program. Thank you very much, Jock. So um, the requirement is two milligrams for the immunization if it's needed, and then additional two milligrams for the screening procedure. Okay, thanks very much. So to the, to the whole audience, um, you can see on your participation screen, you, there is still 
opportunity for you to ask questions about any of the uh, topics. So um, your screen should consist of uh, the slides on the left part of your screen. And on your right, there is um, a field with uh, the overview resources and question tabs. So all participants are welcome to keep on asking their questions as we uh, go through the next the next questions. So I have a question which is for uh, Rob Osborne, I think. The question is the following, is the AccuSeq software described in the presentation needed for the assay workflow? Rob? Hi, Jeff, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, um, so thank you for the question. Um, it, the software is recommended for the workflow because it provides um, that the, the software itself will contain method templates for the ResDNA seq assay itself, and it's also optimized and, and, and fully automated for doing all of the data acquisition and the uh, reporting out of the results. However, if you do already have an existing qPCR platform on site that's not necessarily from Thermo Fisher, you can still implement the assay into any qPCR platform. So while we recommend AccuSeq, it's not an essential part of the workflow. Okay, thank you very much. So that provides the flexibility to users. Very nice, okay. I think we have one more question. I think that's for Anthony in the area of um, the single use fermenter. So the question is, um, you know, uh, what if uh, a particular uh, fermentation user already has, is used to a particular vessel, a fermenter, either at bench scale or is used to a particular controller type, um, maybe applicant or others at larger scale? Uh, how is this compatible with our uh, benchtop and single use fermenter technologies? Is it a question you can take, Anthony? Yeah, hi, Jeff. Thanks for the question. Um, Thermo Fisher operate a open architecture approach for their single use uh, by, uh, fermenters, and we can actually integrate our vessels with existing control platforms that customers may already have implemented in their uh, production areas, or we can use our controllers to actually uh, control other customer or other vendors um, single use or fermenter processes so we, we have an open architecture approach which will allow us to integrate within either an existing platform or our platform I hope that answers the question yeah thanks very much Anthony brilliant very clear we are reaching the end of our webinar so it's time for me to thank all the speakers for their uh, contributions and their great insights. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank all the webinar participants for joining us today and taking the time out of the schedule. I, I hope you have found value in participating in our webinar. The Thermo Fisher scientific team remains available for any uh, further uh, discussions on those topics. And again, I invite anybody interested in joining, learning more uh, to visit our website to register their interest for our Vilnius workshop on May 13th on microbial bioproduction, in which we will go in much more practical details about most of the content of today. This is our webinar. I wish you a great rest of the day. Thanks very much.